Good evening and welcome to this edition of De Facto Review, a weekly roundup of news and current affairs here in Mongolia with Jargal De Facto and myself, Grace Brown. We're live on Facebook at V Television. You can also keep up with the conversation on Twitter, hashtag De Facto. Coming up on the program. Jing cancels planned loan talks with Mongolia after the Dalai Lama's trip to Ulaanbaatar. Candidates to represent Mongolia overseas are presented to the president. Mongolians mark the day they became a sovereign state with a surprise holiday. And the government issues a white zud warning for dozens of towns across the country. We'll be taking a look at how they're preparing for temperatures colder than the Arctic. Thank you for joining us. After much speculation, China has announced that it has cancelled a key intergovernmental meeting with Mongolia following the Dalai Lama's visit to the country this week. Beijing considers the Tibetan spiritual leader to be a separatist. China's foreign ministry said, quote, the Dalai's visit has hurt the political foundation of China-Mongolia relations. And it also called on Mongolia to, quote, respect China's core interests and major concerns. Jargal, this puts uh, Mongolia in a very difficult position because it is an independent country. It can invite who it wants. But at the same time, it's heavily economically dependent on China. 90% of its exports go there. Is it possible for Mongolia to do what it wants mm -hmm. while Let's still see. benefiting from Beijing. Uh, let's see what exactly happened as de facto. Uh, Dalai Lama visited Mongolia, and the way how public had gathered together, mm -hmm. thousands of them all around the country, and listening to his praying of Buddhism, Buddhist teaching, shows how Mongolians are, relig Buddhist religious are in that sense. Many people come, and, and uh, Buddhism is a state religion, or well, we don't officially say state religion, but majority of people's religion is Buddhism, and of course, a head of a spiritual, the spiritual leader of our religion has fully right to visit the country and to uh, meet uh, his prayers in spite of anything, and because as you said, it's an independent country, and we should not please on that somebody else. Uh, on one side. Um, and I think a lot of countries, uh, this is the reaction I've got from friends overseas, journalists overseas, are quite impressed that Mongolia has done this. As so many countries, including Britain, where I'm from, would, um, would heed whatever China said, but Mongolia has decided actually some things are more important than money, and yep, the, Buddhism uh, might but be but one how, of them. However, the reality is uh, China is regarding Dalai Lama as separatist, mm. in spite of his statement. He's not. He's not he's, uh, he, he has different agenda than the Chinese things, he said. That's right. Uh, he uh, said that he hasn't spoken about Tibetan independence since 1974 uh, when he gave a press conference. I am not surprised what had happened, but I'm more surprised the timing of this visit. Yeah. And the visit is just before several and series of events in uh, relations with the uh, large discounted loan from Chinese government. That's right, and, uh, a $4 billion, $4 billion possible dollars, loan, including which currency is, swaps, yep, including investment soft loans. Which is enough to cover all current foreign debts of the country. But I, I, I read it like this. There, uh, there is several uh, uh, certain power in the, in the country which is not interested to receive those loans from China. So okay. that's why I think this uh, visit had happened now. Uh, exactly at this time, and uh, what was expected from China, they have cancelled up to six important trips, including parliamentarian groups, foreign minister trip, etc. So now, the question is, why? Uh, so the cancellation of the or foreign debt or discounted uh, debt loan from China, what does it mean for Mongolia? If they say if it went as it it was planned then we will receive, say, that amount of money to Mongolia. It does not change much 
the way we live, the way the crisis goes on in the country, because Mongolian economic crisis is mostly political crisis, or originate from the way how Mongolia is governed mm. as a state. So if the money comes, we pay 300, no, 580 million US dollar in March in the coming year, 2017, then to the end, 500 million US dollar from the Genghis Khan bond, which is due to uh, final payment back in December. So both will be paid by Chinese money, but nothing will be substantially changed from Mongolian perspective because now we, from this we to pay, now we are to pay to that. But what is Mongolia's plan B, given that the Chinese loan is now up in the air, potentially? I mean, even if the IMF gets involved, it still needs additional financing from other partners, including possibly China. Well, the IMF was, uh, I think, was considered to me by the government as a secondary, second part of this uh, uh, plan. First was the Chinese money. Mm -hmm. Now, since Chinese money is not coming, at least in the near future, now the closest one is IMF with the standby program. But I think this is to be in the place, at least in the new, new year, That's an January step, or in a February. That's an initial million, but not four billion. That, that, that has to come from multiple places. Yeah, it, probably initially a billion dollar or so with the help of, with the contribution of other countries, including China, as China is now as a money, Chinese money is a part of now SDR in IMF basket. Yeah. So it may come through that channel, about that billion or so, but however, it is not probably you are right. And it is a uh, very severe, it makes severe the conditions when Mongolian uh, International Reserve, we call it Mongol Bank, Central Bank uh, International Reserve is, the, if uh, net asset is, net foreign asset is already minus. Why? Because it is consisting of uh, Chinese swap money or uh, yuan money. So now there are 1.5 billion uh, US dollar equivalent of yuan money if it is not extended or if it is required to get paid back now, that will be, Mongolia will be in even worse situation. Mm. So that's the reality. It is not good for uh, Mongolian Tugrik uh, strength. It will be more further devaluation. And, uh, but, uh, Do you think we could hit 3,000 to the US dollar? Uh, I think if things go as it is today easily, it is easily, uh, however, however, the further action of IMF and tension and possible expectation of currency coming to the country may ease the situation. Otherwise, we're almost, uh, we were almost there uh, about two weeks ago. Mm. And with the intervention of the central bank, uh, they have decreased it to further 32 weeks. Um, you know, I wrote an article last week about how to stop that uh, plunge of Mongolian tourists. And one of them was not to make this sort of strong intervention like last time into the market. Mm. Because they have sold 70, over 70 million US dollar to ease Tugrik's situation. And it should not be repeated again in spite of whatever changes in the rate. I mean, really what is needed is more certainty for investors, right? That certainty comes with, I think, a uh, free market rather than a state in intervention. Yeah, yeah. What about Japan and South Korea? Do you think that perhaps they could step up with the funding more now? Most probably, in particular Japan, because the situation in Mongolia, if it gets to the level that we cannot manage, mm -hmm. then like in several times in history since our democratic revolutions, uh, Japan was always in hand. Mm. Interesting, very, very interesting. Well, certainly something to watch closely. Um, moving on, Mongolian candidates for ambassadors overseas were presented to President Elbeg Doj this week. They include Mr. Ravdan Bold as possible ambassador to Turkey, Nyama Narumbat as the possible ambassador to the Czech Republic, uh, former Prime Minister Mend Sachen Enk Sajhan as potential ambassador to Sweden, 
and Mr. Sanj Bayo, also a former Prime Minister, as possible ambassador to the United Kingdom. Jagal, a lot of these names have controversy surrounding them. Could you tell us a bit more about these characters? Yeah, uh, public uh, and uh, social media and uh, the mainstream media was discussing a lot about Mr. Bayar uh, controversy. And uh, public are expecting very clear explanation from either anti-corruption agency or the president office about three things related to Mr. Bayar. One is um, <coughs> during his uh, prime ministership, uh, Hang Resources license for uranium mining, uh, Hang Resources from Canada, was uh, revoked, taken back to the government and was given to Russian uh, investors. And that caused international arbitration. As a result of that arbitration, we, Mongolia had to pay, and we paid already 100 million US dollar. Mm. So now, why and how that explanation is not on public. Second issue is about controversy, having him having uh, several properties in the US under his children's name. And uh, the people have a uh, lot of speculation about that. And the third is uh, he was a, I mean, claimed he is to be a key person on Erdinet giving guarantee to a private company just against its loan to standard chartered 100 million US dollar now with the penalty interest rate altogether 190 million US dollar is to be paid by uh, Irdinet. So there are three controversies where Mongolian public are truly expecting clear explanation from Mr. Bayer and the related authorities. Though Mr. Bayer said at the parliament sessions that he has uh, nothing to do with that, he has no offshore account, etc. And uh, he, he said that he asked an uh, anti-corruption agency to check it, and the answer was he's clean. But that's what he said. But we, want, we expect the anti-corruption agency of Mongolia explaining very clearly to on To come that. out publicly and publicly. confirm this, and yeah. And if my, now he's approved by the president, uh, that means Mr. President has uh, that public, uh, supposedly, uh, the information public supposed to receive he got earlier. Right. So that's the expectation, uh, and um, that's, uh, that's what the Mongolians are talking all week around this nomination. That it should be a transparent process, this particularly if this is the ambassador to Mongolia's third biggest trade partner, the UK. Yes. And the second uh, person, Mr. Ingsakhan, who was also a prime minister, first prime minister of democratic government of Mongolia, mm -hmm. 1996 till the end of 1997. It's only one and a half a year. But this man is... Uh, he was the strong candidate of a strong competitor of president presidential election in 2005. He almost was competing very close to uh, Mr. Inkbayar, who became that year president of the country. Uh, and Mr. Inksahan is certainly a leader, strategic thinking, along with the Mr. Bold, who was the ambassador to Australia and the US before. Now he is regarded to be an ambassador to Turkey. So these are three undoubtedly very talented leaders. And uh, I think it is not that difficult for them to run now for embassy. But however, you know, not easy thing is, unfortunately, uh, a lot of nominees working in all, at all levels of Mongolian embassies abroad are not always selected or nominated based on merit. Mm. There are a lot of political nominees. Uh, unfortunately, many of them are uh, not meeting the requirements of diplomats. So that's the general complaints our, from our embassies abroad. Uh, hopefully these three leaders, where, where they go, if they go, they, they can solve that problem or make easier that, ease this problem, I think. Yeah. That's the expectation. What are some of the key diplomatic and trade issues that they might face? Uh, the, for example, UK or the Sweden or Turkey, they are all um, except I think Sweden is not that strong uh, trade partner, but the others are, and uh, along with China and the US, we, Mongolian government is uh, measuring their success by the amount of foreign investments from their country to Mongolia. Mm. So hopefully to, towards this end, there are undoubtedly uh, good players, I hope. 
will be interesting to see if they are indeed confirmed. Do we know when that will happen? That's uh, the uh, president decisions. Mm -hmm. Most probably at this level it will happen mm -hmm. after discussions of that level of parliament. Then we have because to watch. I think initially it is already agreed with the uh, president. Uh, well, we will watch this space. Um, earlier this week on Friday, Mongolians marked their Independence Day. Uh, November 26, 1924 was the day that Mongolia became a sovereign state and adopted its first constitution. So this year the holiday was held on Friday rather than Saturday because it's already a weekend. So, you know, this was, um, this was a, clearly a very significant <laughs> day. Let's talk about the Unexpected importance of the holiday. day first and then yes. what do you think about it being a surprise? Uh, two surprises. Uh, Several years ago, Mongolia had decided to have a holiday on December 29th because 1911, December 29th, after just collapse of Manqing dynasty in China, uh, under which Mongolia and Han China was existing under, mm. and Mongolia at that time, bogged the Han kind of kingdom, had announced independence from Manchu dynasty. So that's why that, and after two days, Republic of China was uh, proclaimed. Right. Uh, after two days. So we made it two days earlier instead of men. So this is uh, regarded uh, uh, truly independent day by Democratic Party. But the December, uh, the, the 1924, November 24 is, uh, is a day of proclamation of People's Republic of Mongolia. Uh. That's mostly let's like it and celebrate by people's party who is in power mm. the mongolian mm. yeah now party, who, right. whoever comes in this uh, from these two political parties come into the power they announce that or this day is independent day which gives us a thought why these political parties own our part our history why they cannot the country cannot come to one conclusion that this is the beginning of that uh, 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 1911 to one was the Independence Day. Have two holidays, even better. <laughs> or then we have a three must have holidays <laughs> because in 1992, 1992, we have proclaimed the People's, not People's Repo uh, Republic of Mongolia. So Mongolia Kingdom, then a Bogta Mongol State, then a People's Republic of Mongolia, then Republic of Mongolia. You see the three days we have so, but uh, you know, uh, holiday is to be not for the sake of holiday. This is if uh, clearly informed earlier, it could be good business for domestic tourism, which was not the case. Yes, that's right, because this was a surprise a announcement. Just, just was two it? days before, cabinet decided to announce that this was a holiday. And while many who were celebrating Thanksgiving the night before were quite happy to have that next day off. It was inconvenient for businesses. Yeah, if you talk truly about this independence, it was de jure what we have talked now, was de jure, right? And now saying, and now officially. But de facto independence, even today, depends on our values. Our values are democracy, market economy, and education. These are three truly values that make Mongolia forever independent, I believe. And so you believe that the so this uh, the celebration of this independent day, whatever they agree, whatever day is the right one, but the independence day should be around these values, how much we value, how much we develop it, how strong we are on each of them. So then we raise uh, several other many issues that we are facing today. Mm -hmm. So celebration or holiday is to be important day that makes better our life better our belief in our future. Not so that one day earlier you announce it and you should have, don't go to, the, to your work next day. So this is ridiculous. And it should be announced the year before. Yeah. So there should be more notice and of course. employers can plan, families can plan, and they can market more appropriately. If that's, that's exactly what we would like to see. Yeah. There are a lot of surprise um, holidays in Mongolia, or at least 
changing holidays, moving holidays. I mean, some of these depend on the lunar cycle, like Sagan Saar, for example. Um, and that's yep. coming up uh, at the end yes. of February, which is, which is interesting because the rest of Asia will mark the Lunar New Year one month earlier at the end of January. See, uh, public holiday is very important because it's almost, say, 2% of GDP is created one day. So whether you take that day off or on, it's an important issue. If you take it off, so what is the compensation? What other values are coming? so that in the future it is compensated. That's, I think, the way we should approach public holiday. Yeah. Well, hopefully there will be more consistency and certainty with holidays in future. Um, turning now to the heavy snow we've been seeing here in Mongolia in recent weeks, the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, has declared 23 towns across nine provinces in the country as being in a state that it calls a white zud. Um, this is characterized by heavy snowstorms and temperatures colder than the North Pole. Um, some of these regions include areas quite close to the capital Ulaanbaatar, such as Dahan, Henti in the east, and then way out west, Uvs, uh, Hovskul, and Bayan Olgi. So, Jago, what are these places doing to prepare for this cold? Okay, before a bit about more Zut. Zut for nomads mean that there is so much snow that small, smaller animals cannot move. They stay where, where they are because the snow is becoming uh, even taller than their horse. And the horse, cows, they can move themselves more or less up to the half of their body level height. But then the remaining cannot eat, so they starve and die. That's what it means. And uh, unfortunately, this year again, we have a lot of snow, and uh, that's in the countryside issue. And uh, for that, they should harvest more grasses during the summertime. For the real issue is also coming in Ulaanbaatar city. And it's uh, just always a surprise every year because our city management is behaving like there is no winter. Oh, no apparently we, we're running out of uh, salt, salt to de-ice <laughs> the roads. And yeah. it's, it's astonishing. Um, you know, the emergency, uh, the... the trauma center has said that they're getting up to 350 injuries a day and 60 percent of these are people who are just slipping on ice so it's quite a concern do you think that the capital where half of mongolians live is adequately prepared for this winter uh, of course not it again shows that we are our management is not ready for the sort of even a heavy snow it is in the country where we do expect and we do receive every year that much an amount of snow. Right. So it shows that we need to change the management method of the city. And uh, every district, we have eight or so districts, Ulaanbaatar city, and they are to be independently, autonomously ready for the sort of uh, natural disaster. Mm -hmm. They are to to have this proper uh, certain equipment, everything to and on time to fight against heavy snow. And like in uh, many countries in your country, in the UK, in the US, the snow, as soon as snow comes, the local people fight with them from the beginning, right? Um, particularly on the road. So that means... Mm, well, they've, we they've mobilized um, students and soldiers and yes, companies to get out and break the ice, which is which is interesting, and that's something that we don't see well, actually in many other places. Yeah, because exactly to avoid this whole situation of mobilization of everybody from their businesses, people pay tax to take care of uh, this situation. Public this services. This sort of situation. And the public service is not working in that way, two reasons. One, they are frequently changing, the institutionally never being strong. Mm -hmm. they, from year to year, uh, from election to election, they change the leaders of that institutions and funds and the restructuring of the institutions. They never get ready for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is uh, we don't have proper uh, uh, the real estate property tax in Mongolia, which is the base for any situation, in particular in cities, because from this real estate tax, say 3%, 1% goes to maintenance of the area. And that includes heavy snow, a lot of rain, drainage, all these issues. Maybe earthquake. 
Or it similar will. to a council tax in the UK, yeah. So that, that should be there, mm. and which some, somehow is not happening. In particular, it is not happening because state-owned real estate, they don't pay taxes in this country. And then the private sectors are very hesitant to pay the tax because it asks why they don't pay. Why well, should pay for them to take care of the maintenance of the area? So this sort of management situation in the country a lot to need to a lot improve when nobody was working on nobody is working on that unfortunately. That's a very good point. Yeah. Well the obviously the capital has um, much work to do. But outside of the capital, um, for those herders who could be seeing snow levels that you're describing, um, pretty uh, terrifying to think about up to a horse's height. Yes. Um, you know, what, how prepared are governments out there? Apparently the Ministry of Agriculture and Light Industry says we're at 82% complete in terms of uh, winter preparation. They say so, but uh, we will see that in the, in the way how many stocks livestock we lose or not lose, and uh, what is the communication with them? Because mostly, a lot of places are just completely cut off from the road. There is no other way to reach them somehow. Yeah, well, so I'm confused because the ministry says that, like I said, it's it's about eighty percent ready. Then why are they also saying that 70% of these places will see heavy losses in livestock? Uh, that's one of the controversies we will make clear down the road. It's always happening every year. They say that it's, uh, they are ready for everything, but the life shows that it, they are not. Mm. And uh, life also proves that those who had prepared during summer for the sort of uh, uh, natural disaster who those who had prepared enough amount of grasses harvested, then those are usually always better off. Right. So let's see what will happen. Well, one positive thing, um, I think we see some pictures of dog sledding, uh, is that now the dog sledding season has officially opened here in Ulaanbaatar. So it may be very cold, but there is one fun thing that you can do out in the countryside. Uh, it involves being pulled along by huskies on a frozen river and a sleigh. Have you ever tried dog uh, sledding? Not myself, but I think Mongolia has a lot of winter uh, tourism potential, yeah. provided that we have a good, nice, warm accommodation in everywhere. Small, it not to be a five-star hotel, but it is to be tiny, comfortable, warm place with good shower or sauna. Mm. And then it is. Uh, it can create a lot of potential to invite foreign tourists in winter too. I mean, in some countries, even there is an ice hotel. People are coming and staying there overnight, paying two hundred U.S. dollar. So there is, if compared with having this in idea, uh, we can do a lot. Why things, not? Why Mongolia. not here in Mongolia? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that brings this edition of De Facto Review to an end. Thank you very much for joining us, and we hope that you can tune in again next week. From Jargul and myself, Saikh yeah. Namrare, good night. Thank you very much. See you next week. Thank you.